Hi and welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we come to you every Wednesday as veterinarians and technicians in general practice to get you to the point where you are the best you can be in general practice dentistry. Five episodes, we're gonna be transitioning to pain management and we're honored to have Dr. Mark Epstein, veterinary pain management expert, medical director at Total Bond Veterinary Hospitals in North Carolina, and a certified veterinary pain practitioner to join us here. He's a diplomat and past president of the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners and a past president of the International Veterinary Academy of Pain Management. Dr. Epstein also co-chaired the AHA and AAFP pain management guidelines, led the AHA Senior Care Guidelines Task Force, and was awarded the 2022 Vidica Small Animal Educator of the Year Award at the Western Veterinary Conference. So Dr. Epstein recorded these in a live workshop back in 2023, so they're all very recent. All five episodes are categorized based on the agent. They are brief for a reason because there's a lot of information in each one. So please sit back and enjoy Dr. Mark Epstein. So we're gonna move on to some other uh, kind of uh, pain modifying drugs. These are gonna be oral ones. And the, the conversations about tramadol that have been going on for some years now, are pretty much settled by now, that the oral form of it in dogs is simply um, no strong evidence that it's effective for both either for post-surgical pain and also for actually, for frankly, for osteoarthritis pain as well, which I think I shared that study, that Buzzwork study at the University of Georgia. So when it says that the evidence for its efficacy is low or very low, that's actually pretty generous. There's almost none. And so I think we can now settle on the matter that tramadol, oral tramadol, is simply not a drug we should lead into uh, for pain management in dogs. Now, what about for cats? Because the evidence for cats is actually pretty strong. Um, it is a, uh, has an opioid metabolite, so it can give that part of the benefit. Plus, it enhances uh, norepinephrine and serotonin, has you know, pharmacokinetics that are very similar to people, uh, unlike dogs. Um, however, it's, you know, uh, very, very bitter. And so to give it orally is very hard. And then the question becomes, can you give it transdermally? That would be a great uh, tool because it, it would be effective, we would think, if it can actually get into plasma. Unfortunately, at least in the formulation that was used in this study, it did not. So we still don't have any kind of predictable way to get it to them unless you kind of get it into a palatable oral form. And some people believe they, that can be done. And if it can be done, then you're on pretty good evidence-based ground for an effective uh, drug in cats. Uh, can have a little more in the way of adverse side effects, extra pyramidal, central nervous system, system effects in cats. Um, but uh, getting it to them is a problem. So uh, this is uh, comparing a different molecule to pentanol to tramadol. Now remember that uh, tramadol has different metabolites. Some of it's opioid and some of it enhances these inhibitory neurotransmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, whereas to pentanol, the parent molecule does both of those things. And uh, it says that uh, essentially looking at it in dogs and cats, that uh, tramadol is probably the superior option because of side effects um, that tapitidol gave. So again, um, I'm not saying that uh, you can't use the, the, that this kind of a product, but in cats, probably stick around with the tramadol if you can get it into them safely. And when it comes to dogs, um, maybe it will work, but we need more um, work. We need more evidence to show it. So this is like going to be a, um, a therapeutic in progress of its study. When we think about the uh, gabapentinoids in dogs and cats, we have a lot of evidence that it can work for various neuropathic pain conditions. Remember, it kind of downregulates calcium channels presynaptically and postsynaptically through different kinds of mechanisms. And so I think we can say with some confidence that, yeah, it, it can have a benefit when there's a neuropathic component to pain. And these are certain syndromes uh, that have been identified in its use in dogs and cats. I'm going to kind of kind of compartmental way the gabapentin in cats <clears throat> because the, the 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 pharmacokinetics of it is a little bit different than in dogs and people for that matter. You recall that in dogs you have to kind of escalate the dose um, up to you know 10, 15, 20 mg per kg over time to achieve and maintain plasma levels. 
And we thought that for a long time was with cats, but here we have this um, study that shows that really beyond eight mix per kg chronically, um, you don't need to go much beyond that. So in our practice, we kind of tap out at that eight to 10 mix per kg dose that unlike dogs, we're not pushing it up to 15, 20 mix per kg or even higher sometimes. What about transdermal in uh, cats? Well, this is a maybe. This was an in vitro study, um, but it, you know, the molecule was labeled and found to kind of, you know, creep across into the deeper layers of the skin, kind of that stratum corneum. So you can make a um, hypothetical case that it might work in cats, at least with the product that was used in this study. And then it seems that it has a uh, appetite stimulating effect and that's, uh, that is equivalent to mirtazapine, at least post-op for a spay. And that's not a, you know, the most invasive procedure ever, uh, but, you know, you may get a twofer, right? So if you're using gabapentin for post-operative pain, you may have some appetite stimulation effect in cats. Now, uh, what about this idea of using it for surgical pain? And I, I quoted in the previous article, you know, a number of different systematic reviews in dog and uh, humans, I beg your pardon, to show that, yeah, there, it seems on balance to have a pretty predictable effect um, in for post-surgical pain. But this is a Cochrane systematic review. It's a very discriminating systematic review that they were not able to determine uh, with any certainty that it has a, a benefit for post-operative pain. But then just a couple of years later was this uh, particular systematic review of uh, and said that, yeah, it seems to. Actually, three of the four studies said, yes, it does. So with that in mind, it's still controversial. Um, and if you're going to ask, you know, do we make use of it perioperatively and post-surgically in our patients? We do. I think it has a number of potential benefits, including uh, hopefully a pain-modifying effect, but others as well. So I, this is what I leave you with. It remains controversial. I'm not trying to pretend that it's not. Um, but we still make use of it in this uh, domain in our practice. Uh, using pregabalin, pregabalin is the kind of the, is Lyrica, it's the generic, uh, I beg your pardon, the trade version of that. And there is pharmacokinetic data uh, for dogs and, and cats. And you can see the dose here, although these doses were for anticonvulsant uses. And if we decide to kind of gravitate over to pregabalin, the advantage is that you don't, have, you don't have this dose escalation need that you do in dogs and in humans for gabapentin and to a lesser extent in cats. The dose is the dose. Now, the problem is that you can't split the tablets, and so you would have to get it compounded. It is a scheduled drug. Gabapentin is already scheduled in several states in the UK, but pregabalin is an FDA federally um, controlled drug, so we just have to kind of keep that in mind. What about the evidence for pregabalin? Because I think we're going to be gravitating to it over time um, from gabapentin since it's now generic. And this one shows that it does have a significant uh, effect on postoperative pain after uh, intervertebral disc surgery in dogs, which is a you know very high surgical dose that has nerve injury. So that's good to know and might even be expected in that. And then there are some case reports about using it in certain kinds of um, neuropathic pain conditions in both dogs and cats. So I, I don't want to read tea leaves too much. Um, I will tell you that in other parts of the world, South America, for example, pregabalin is the go-to uh, gabapentinoid rather than gabapentin. I think, uh, again, I am going to read the tea leaves, I guess, and tell you that probably over time, uh, we'll be gravitating to that here in North America as well. Amantadine, um, you know, we have that one study in dogs to show that as an adjunct to NSAIDs, those dogs did better than on, uh, with osteoarthritis. In dogs with osteoarthritis, the combination of amantadine and NSAIDs did better than dogs with receiving just the NSAIDs. Here's one showing uh, evidence in cats. Now, interestingly, these cats walked less, but when watched carefully, the quality of their gait improved and their overall quality of life based on some clinical metrology, metrology instruments also improved. So we have some evidence that it can be of benefit in cats as well. Moving over to acetaminophen. Uh, this is uh, APAP or paracetamol. And the, you know, the pharmacokinetics and the clinical data, you know, I, it, it's all a little controversial. We get mixed data. On balance, there doesn't seem to be um, strong evidence that it can or should, based on its pharmacokinetics, 
have a pain modifying effect in dogs, but um, it, 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 you know, this study out of the UK probably supports what you or, and or colleagues you are talking to may be feeling that no, because of its safety profile and uh, subjectively that there is a pain modifying effect that we're re-embracing it. You know, for years and years and years, it's been the most commonly used analgesic drug on the human side. We've avoided it, generally speaking, in dogs. Um, obviously, we completely avoid it in cats, but uh, now it seems like it's gaining some additional traction. In, term, in terms of some of the potential adverse effects you've seen, um, while um, there's a few, generally speaking, veterinarians find it to be a very, very, very safe uh, type of a therapeutic. And again, gaining traction in the UK, I, I believe here in the US as well, and maybe in your practice too, even though keeping in mind that the data behind it has a very short half-life in dogs, plasma half-life. Uh, it uh, doesn't reach plasma levels uh, that one would expect it to have an analgesic activity, like would be found in people, for example. Um, and that the, the clinical data is very mixed about whether it does or doesn't. So certainly nothing on the evidence-based spectrum, but maybe in the future years we'll find that it does because it may not actually depend on what happens in plasma, but what's happening in the brain, that this drug reaches and binds to receptors centrally rather than anything peripherally or systemically. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. If you are a veterinarian and you wanna be one of the best in dentistry in general practice and take your team to that level as well. The Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program can get you there. Please visit IVDI.org and put in an application today and hopefully we'll see you soon in the future in our meetings and in our virtual extraction wet labs. We'll see you next week.